So we, we heard a wonderful story about DIT, a great success in application. So what I want to discuss with you are some of the, the last systematic errors. Of course, the vendor wall uh, description, that lack of vendor wall description with normal semi-local functionals uh, is clearly a systematic error. And, um, Adrian uh, Rulinski's talk addressed that. So Van der Waal is excluded from a discussion as a large systematic error. So what are the other large systematic errors the normal functional we have? So I'll start with a uh, very simple example. Uh, the simplest molecule in the whole world, it's 2 plus, it's a single molecule with one electron. So you, you calculates energy as a function of the bone length. You, uh, so this is the Hutchie Fock answer. And because this system is one electron, so Hutchie Fock is exact. So you have an exact answer. You call exact. Only for one electron, Hutchie Fock exact. But for other, it's not asked. So this is R0. It's Pretty good described uh, uh, by your LDA. We take an LDA, and if energy is lower, and kind of like this, but then it goes like this. So this is your LDA picture. So at equilibrium, we have error. Those are very small error. Those are quantitative error and good bone lengths, good energy, and small errors. At last distance, these are what I call systematic errors, large systematic errors. And not only for H2+, there's an uh, uh, example, you can do this one, helium 2 plus, do the calculation of helium 2 plus, then you will get even lower energy at last distance than the equilibrium and completely wrong answer. So here, this answer is very, very wrong. Something very, very wrong here compared to the right answer. Qualitative failure. And uh, also, this deviation here, where significant deviation happened, is really very close to the equilibrium. At least equilibrium is around one angstrom, maybe here will be 2.5 or something, you'll see already deviate. And so it's the error, of course, the error is at this dissociation limit. So what, what is the problem is um, this is not just an isolated case. It relates to a very large class of problem, systematic error in DRT. So um, I'll list some of the errors that you can see here. One is um, when you get Brain gap too small. Prediction of normal DRT functional for brain gap is too small. If you are uh, reaction barrier, chemical reaction barrier too low. If you calculate polarizability for a low molecule, too much, way over estimate. Sometimes can be 300% uh, over estimate for probability from LDA calculation. Um, if you are interested in conductions, calculating the the current versus voltage for, for a circuit or molecular circuits, um, frequently you have too much, too high conductance. So these are all, they appear very, very different in terms of problem application, error in application. But they have all had a common origin at this problem. And I'll, I'll show you how we understand this problem. 
So um, this problem was, was recognized uh, really in the 90s, in the 90s, and then um, that uh, one one paper that uh, might be interesting to you is Zhang and Yang, uh, 1998. So Zhang and Yang, 1998, JCP. That paper was analyzed this problem and point out that this was a uh, was a self infection error problem and it related to fractional systems because uh, when they, when you dissociate S2 plus, uh, you have two photons and one electron. So the proper answer is the electron is localized in the two centers. And uh, when you, as you stretch, stretch, then you get half electron at one end and half electron at the other end. And this, the energy for this is too low. So it has, that's the simple statement. The, uh, it was until uh, it wasn't until uh, 2008 when this was realized as a uh, violation of um, a condition that already mentioned in uh, uh, Leo's talk this morning. It's the PPLB condition. So 2008, from a paper by uh, Paula Mori Sanchez. Coleman and then myself. Um, this was a uh, paper in 2008. We recognized that this was actually, uh, this is a violation um, and uh, it is related to this delocalization. But there are, of course, there are other papers earlier. In 2006, we had published a paper and John published a paper in the same year too. Uh, relate to the problem to the PDRB conditions. But the local, uh, I'll come to it. So what we recognized was that it's a deviation from the PPLB condition. So this is the uh, energy as number of electrons, PPLB, this paper, to 1982, PRL. And, and minus 1 and n. So this is the exact condition for a grand canonical ensemble solution for fractional number of electrons at zero temperature, and that's the exact condition. But our normal functional, what happens is our normal functional kind of like this. Okay. So this is your GGA, LDA, or even hybrid. Have different degree. GCA out here look very similar. Hybrid has smaller error, but it's still error. So the deviation from this exact condition uh, was observed. This was in, and also in a different color. There's also, if you look at Hutchie Fock, Hutchie Fock behaved in a concave way, so opposite to, so this is how you work. So it's opposite to the normal LDA GTA performance. So what are the, so this is the observation, you can do the calculation. So how do you, first question is how do you do the calculation for fractional uh, systems, fractional charge? So you can use, there are two ways. One way is that, well, I can follow the PDLP condition, I calculate the electron for energy for n, n minus n plus 1 and n minus 1 and draw a straight line. Yes, you can do that calculation and that's a prediction of the functional, but that prediction has no consequence to the analysis that we're talking about here. The analysis come from a calculation is that you occupy the orbital, the homo or the lumo, in here will be the homo, in here will be the lumo, you occupy the, the homo or lumo with fractional electron number, fractional charge. And that calculation is running because uh, you can, the analysis has been carried out is that at the dissociation limit, this is exactly what happens if you have half electron in the uh, homo. Okay. So this 
the, the consequence of this is the following. It, means, it says it, it is all the functions now and for all the system behave like this. So it mean, means that the error at the half of fractional 16 is larger than the integer. It's not like integer is perfect. Integer has smaller error. And at the last, last uh, as the fractional one, it has large, larger error and the half is the maximum in terms of the error. So, so what will this concept, this error will do is will, for this case, it will delocalize electrons. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you. So this is delocalization. And uh, the blue one is localization. So let me explain why it's localized and why it's delocalized. And I also come to how can be this can be understood for H2 plus or can be really right. So imagine you have two sixteen. Two molecules are not interacting. It has a curve like this, and you add an electron to the system, non interacting. And if your functional is exact with a straight line, then your energy of N, energy of N, plus half. Should be equal to energy of n minus one. So because you are adding electron, this is electron on a plasma, sorry. So this is electron goes to one, one molecule, this is A, this is B. So you two send two molecules and you add electron to the system, it really doesn't matter whether you spread that electron equally because it degenerate. Okay? So this is the right answer. But if you have the localization error. then this condition is less than right? because of the convex curve. So the half electron answer is here. It's always less than the average of this endpoint. Then you, if you have localization error, then the, the opposite. is true. So if your functional already had a built-in bias, built-in systematic error that will delocalize the added electrons or localize the added electrons. And, and while the true answer should be determined, so that's the built-in error. Okay. So that's the name. And then let me um, say one more thing. How is that related to this set of problems? Uh, Bring that. I will talk a little bit. Let's take reaction barrier. Why is reaction barrier too low? This is reaction barrier calculated energy at the transition state versus at the uh, normal chemical structure. Think about uh, which state has more delocalized feature of electrons. At one stage, you have chemical bond are well structured, they're stable compounds. At transition state, you are breaking a bond or forming a bond. So actually, the electrons are delocalized between the bond that's being broken and the bond that's being formed. So the electron is more delocalized at the top. Right? So if the electron is more delocalized at the top, 
you are when you use a semi-local functional, you're looking at a frictional. Its atom is more like seeing a frictional distribution. Right. So it's a more delocalized than the ground state. Yes. Well, if we have a reaction in an aromatic cycle, and uh, we go, for example, uh, uh, make a few uh, aromatic substitution. Uh, yes, so there are, there are cases. There are cases, that it is opposite, with metal. Okay. With metal in, in that. There are cases, okay. yes. There are cases that this is not, it's the opposite. And it, but the same level. Okay. It's the same level. But I did another thing that, that isn't like a, a higher energy of the position state sometimes you, for example, do different type of contribution, for example, static hindrance. So, no, static hindrance shouldn't be a problem. In, in, it should not be a systematic error in the function. Oh. It's this distribution that you got some more localized versus you got some more delocalized. Okay. And the more delocalized is, is in here. So the delocalization error has two consequences. That's what I want to say. It has two consequences. The most cases the localization error has two low two consequences. Number one, it will give you too low energy for delocalized distribution. Right. And that's what happened in traditional state. And then second one, you will delocalize electron whenever possible in a calculation. It will give you two delocalized distribution. And, and you can see this in a, in a calculation. Uh, in a, in a car panel calculation, GTA of molecule in water, for example, chloride in water, uh, you know, you see actually the, the, the charge is not localized in chloride but spread out in all the water molecules. So there's two consequences, too low energy for delocalized distribution and too delocalized flow. So they, um, we, um, for, to understand this PPLP, uh, this, this of course, this is the, the correct result and a really important result, but it can be understood in a, in a way that uh, you can divide and I'll divide in a, in a but in a very, very different way. It has nothing to do with grain canonical ensemble. It's a pure state. So, so let, me, let me go on. I will use this same example. Water, uh, no, H2 plus. H proton A. No, let's not call H because when it's less than proton. So proton B. So we have one proton, another proton, separate by infinity. You can consider the system at dissociation limit. The first state you can think about is, well, the exact answer should be a hydrogen atom and a proton, right? That's the right answer. So hydrogen atom will mean that you have one electron here and no electron. Okay, that's one answer. I can think of a degenerate answer. So this is degenerate quantum mechanics. I can think of another answer where I have no electron in proton A and one electron in proton B. That is a valid answer. These two solutions are degenerate. Let me think about a third wave function. The, the, the rigorous consequence of linear equation, Jordan's uh, equation uh, in quantum mechanics, is that any degenerate solution can be linear combined and is still a, a degenerate answer. So degenerate arc solutions are not unique. You can linear combine any degenerate answer can get a degenerate answer. So I'm following this. I'm taking this just the average of one and two. Okay. And then this should have the same energy, right? The interesting thing is that when you look at wave function, it's really not very interesting. It's just normal quantum mechanics for degenerate states. But if you look at the electron distribution, something really interesting happens. This state for proton A, what kind of electron distribution you have? 
S. One S. One S, yes. How many? One. No, it can't be. Oh, oh side three. Five, five, side three, yes. Half. Yeah. Half. Yeah. Yeah, half and half. So so this is a um, so in terms of electron density, something dramatic happened. You suddenly look at an object with half electrons. The other half, yes, exists, but it's infinity far away. And the electron distribution do not see it. Electron, unlike the wave function, wave function has to write down all the coordinates of electrons, right? Then you have to have indecent number of electrons. There's no way you can write down a wave function with a fractional number of electrons. But for electron density, well, you integrate the space, and uh, all you see is you have half electron. The other four is infinity far away. So you have half electron. So you are you are forced to face the concept of half electron, and this is all because the degenerate quantum mechanics in wave function, but manifested in density. And when you're looking at in density, you have this really strange but interesting result. So so then I can not only define these half electrons as what it is. I can I know what the energy too, right? What is energy? The energy of this energy of this half electron. I have two of half, so this is twice of the energy of this of this wave function. It should be the same as this and that, right? So the energy of electron or electron. Right? So this is exactly the relationship of no electron, one electron in between. This is the linear, the PPLB curve in the middle. So this derivation is very different from the original PPLB condition. This derivation was given in a paper from, uh, from my group in 2000, on PR, published in PIF. It's derived from pure state consideration, but degenerate state. Degenerate states quantum mechanics, because the degeneracy in quantum mechanics so up at in, wave, in, in electron density. So half electron, you have to define it, and we know what is energy, yes? Uh, what can you say about the spin of such a system? Very good question. That will come later in a <laughs> little bit, yes? Wonderful question. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so so here I only look at the total electron number, I don't care about spin. This is spin bright analysis. Spin will come later. Okay. So so and then this analysis can be generalized to any number of electrons, any fraction, by the same argument. It's more complicated, but exactly the same. So you can see that you can derive the PPLP condition with only one, uh, one, two, three, four lines. Really simple. And it's very easy to understand this story. One question that maybe during your break or in the evening you can think about it. Same argument, how do I get a different fraction? How do I get one third? How do I get this point? Yeah. Very good to think about it. Shouldn't be that hard. I can use the same argument to get your one third. Okay. All right. So So these are exact conditions from uh, pure state degenerate quantum mechanics. Now, the spin problem. So this is one set of problems related to, to the error in the frictional charge. And that's that's a that's a systematic error because all the functional probably plot look like this, and that's caused a systematic error. The second type of systematic error is um, associated with spin. Adding one more electron to the problem, and let's look at the calculation result. 
So exact curve to look like this, somewhat like that, like this one too. Okay. So now how to fork the LDA? Let's say LDA. LDA also described quite nicely. But at nicely at the equilibrium and good equilibrium bone lengths, and that's why LDA TTA have very similar picture to this. Okay. So LDA TTA. And how should we work? I'm going to use the Hatchet okay. Fork now has much larger error in this problem. So this is a spin restricted calculation. Means it's meaning that you, you carry out a calculation with spin restriction. Uh, you don't keep look for the broken symmetry answer, look for a single answer. A single answer means that there's no spin density everywhere. If you, uh, of course, if you use a broken symmetry answer, you get a different picture, and that's not what I want to talk about. So if you use a restricted calculation, preserve the symmetry, that's all you get. So this is also last schematic error. So then the analysis is exactly the same thing with the spin. So I'm going to do that now. Is the spin. So you have proton A. Proton B, first wave function, one, is now we want to consider spin explicitly now. You can dissociate into two a uh, uh, broken symmetry axiom with spin up and spin down. So at infinity, it is a correct answer. Okay. Because at infinity, two hydrogen atoms, and that's one answer. Can think about second answer. So let's say degenerate solution. This two way function are degenerate. But, and uh, I'm using my same trick again. I consider third wave function as the average of psi one and psi two. Okay, again, looking at wave function is not that interesting. But looking at the electron density and the spin, something interesting happens. So what is the spin of this wave function, of this state? How about electron? Electron is one and one, right? Electron number is one and one. What is the spin? Louder. Very good, yes. because it has no spin density with one electron. The only way you can have is half of the electron up and half the electron down. And that's a determined answer. So, so this is the fractional spin <coughs> concept. This um, fractional spin, so the energy of this, you can do the same analysis. <clears throat> then this is identical because if this energy is equal to this and equal to this. And so energy as a spin polarization, but it can have spin up or has spin down. And here is this half up, up and half down. The energy has to be the same. Not only they have to be the same for this discrete number, but actually it's the same for a continuous distribution. So it can be 30% up and, and then 20, uh, 30 up, 70% up and 30% like down. Any, any of these linear combinations. Question? Yeah. 
Oh yes, no, no, not two, not two. Same number of electrons. Because this is twice. Yes. It is not totally clear to me what do you mean with up, down, up. Is it something like singlet or triplet state? It is not a. It is a density has no spin density, so it cannot be a triplet. It is. A, it is the way to describe a singlet. This is what it in chemistry called open cell singlet. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 yeah. It's an, uh, unlike a regular singlet. It's an open cell singlet. <laughs> Yes. But this would also follow a Pauli's principle then? Are these fermions or, or how Fermion, of course, absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Not only uh, this but also uh, the same argument has been expanded in this paper in two thousand P P I L. I think it was Yang, Dang and Bass. We also prove that the dependency for any general electron density This is a condition that's proven that in this paper. Why can you mean? Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. So this is a degenerate state, giving a degenerate density, the energy of that density, and this is a linear combination of degenerate density. So you may think, oh, this looks the same as linear, linear quantum mechanics. It's not, because it's not linear combination of wave function. This is a linear combination of electron density, so it's dramatically different from the the design of quantum mechanics, but it's exactly that that was proven in, in, in this paper. No, I don't have to have a sum. It's any any of the right. Right. any of the wrong general. Exactly. That is it. Must have only wrong without the right. No, 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 no. It can be any oh, I should put J. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yes? Um suppose I have a magnetic field. Yes. Okay. And so up to the back. So just got one. Then you break the degeneracy. Well, would would five one and five two be? Depending if you you have a local magnetic field, then these two will not be degenerate. Suppose it wasn't local. Suppose it was a global magnetic. Uh, you have a global magnetic. Then you suppose then it's this energy. These two energy are not the same. Yeah. But then I can still do the same argument. Yeah. Okay. If it's global, if you have a local magnetic field, then you break the symmetry. Okay. But if it's a global one, I can global. I can apply the same argument. Okay. So it's, it's this is really really a, a surprising result, and we didn't realize at that time how really relevant to to the to the uh, to chemistry until until 2008 when when relate to the, the this problem, relate to this dissociation problem. So so what how it relate to this dissociation problem is uh, when you dissociate H2 plus uh, H2 uh, stretched to infinity uh, you are looking at the energy of this. So LDA this is LDA. The, the behavior out here, instead of following this constancy condition, it has a big bubble. And Hartree Fock has even bigger. So the error here is the static correlation error. The error in the functional, the schematic error in functional, and reflected here. This is exactly the dissociation limit. So, so the um, so that's why in the original title I had the determinants. It's really a uh, to me this fractional charge and fractional spin is really a remarkable uh, 
condition from all come from degeneracy in wave function in quantum mechanics. Yes? So, and here you said that for LDA and GDA it's uh, less than the <laughs> Much bigger. Much bigger. Yeah, right now for LDA and for other both are bigger than Yes. Both they have the same assign uh, different magnitude. Yes, but it's in the case of spin both are getting higher Why they Oh, that's the observation. That's what we get. I, I don't have a simple answer. I can explain why this relates to the error of this, and it also relates to the error of many other problems near degeneration problems. So the error we get at larger distances is because of the error. Absolutely. This last distance is when you plot this line to infinity, this line match this line, this match this. Okay. In, uh, in 2009, this condition, the PPLB condition for fractional charge and uh, the fractional spin condition was combined. So the, the combined result, I'll show you the one. Fractional charge and fractional spin is combined. In the, so this fractional charge was one degree freedom in, in terms of degeneracy. Fractional spin is another degree freedom. And this can be combined because they are all degeneracy. So combine and then we divide the result of that combined result. It's an energy. Now it's in terms of proxy. Degeneracy, we sum over all the degeneracy. So the P and Q are a positive integer and uh, it, it, it relates to how the, the fractional charge. And this C and D are, are degeneracy within that N electron state and N plus one electron state. So this actually is two dimensional. One is along the, the degeneracy and one along fractional charge. Yes, it should be the J in this case. Oh yes, thank you. So so in the um this look very complicated, but uh, for um the if you look at the spin and it's in the constant condition one line, but look at the fractional charge is a linear line between the integers. So for the hydro, for the same for the system as the analog model of this expression, this is uh, two a piece of paper folded in the middle, a square paper folded in the middle, and this is the picture. So what is this is a hydrogen atom. On the top is hydrogen atom plus. Right here, this corner is hydrogen with spin up, and this corner is hydrogen with spin down. And here is H with two electrons. So it's minus. So the energy, if we fold in this way, if we go along this line, this is exactly the PPLB condition. And go along this line, this line is this fractional spin condition. But now, since I we have combined the two things together, it's become two dimensional. This was one dimensional, this was another dimensional. So we combined it and then this is a two-dimensional object. 
So the energy has to be defined for every fractional variable on this plane, on these two sets of plane. And it's, of course, this is number, uh, the number from wave function theory. But for density functional theory, now you have a more complex condition. You have, but um, every point is defined, and you have to have so satisfy this condition. So in particular, uh, this derivative discontinuity as it's an integer here, because this line, this line, has to be along the entire line, not just at one point. At the entire line of this, and that's making it even more challenging. And without describing the discontinuity in the middle, uh, this is really one critical point for very important point for describing the gap of a more issue later, as best as you can do at this point. So this is the model. All right, now um, I'll come to my. So this we analyze two systematic error: the delocalization localization error associated with fractional charge, and the static correlation error associated with uh, fractional speeds. And they can be combined into two-dimensional picture. And when you fail the condition, when you then you'll see the example in chemical application they fail. And all in bank gap calculation in many things. So these are really critical uh, conditions that I also try to, to address in functional development. So now ne my next topic related to this of us is directed discontinuity and gap. So I'm going to <coughs> and there are many uh, groups in the world that are working on trying to solve this systematic error problem in DRT. That's an active area of research. <laughs> so now, derivative engineering, I will introduce one concept, very interesting concept first, the chemical potential. The chemical potential is a thermal dynamic quantity that relating to adding a particle energy, free energy of adding particle taking the particle away. Of course, one state has that too. And in particular, we have extended the electron number to fractional one. So one can define the chemical potential as the derivative of total energy with respect to number of electrons. And uh, while we keep the external potential constant. Okay. So that means that the, the slope in the in the uh, plan uh, along the along the changing particle number, so that chemical potential. And uh, since the energy is this way, right? That's the PDLV condition. Then the derivative is not continuous. Derivative, left derivative, uh, right derivative, and left derivative are not the same. So you can have a uh, chemical potential. The left the left side will be the chemical potential when you taking from the electron deficient side and that will be equal to minus i. That's exactly out from the PPLP condition. Right? The plus one will be do the same thing but adding electron side, then it will be minus a. So that's not. That's from the PDLB condition or the PDLB paper as well. The interesting thing is how do we calculate the chemical potential? This quantity will be so important. How do we calculate it? We have we have constant calculations, and we never have uh, before. Never have a electron number as a variable. So how do we obtain this quantity? And this was um, okay. Let me let me talk about the gap first. I'll, I'll I'll come back to how to calculate the chemical potential in more moment. But the gap is um, equal to the difference. Right? So 
So the category of tensile discontinuity at the integer is the gap, the fundamental gap. And uh, mm, there are many ways, or at least two different ways to look at the gap from this formula. And if you, uh, if and it leads to different picture, but identical result, but a different different perspective. One is um, you can obtain, you can solve the, you can define the chemical potential as the following. This is the uh, equation that you you encounter in the Thomas formula theory when your energy is a function of density and you apply the euler Lagrangian condition for conserving particle number, the chemical potential equal to this formula, right? That's exactly that. So this is the same chemical potential, yeah? So this will have the Gs plus Exc plus the Hartree plus the external potential. That all these terms, the functional derivative. And you, you resolve this equation, you get the Thomas forming answer. The uh, GS, this has uh, this morning, Neo already saw that the Hartree potential has no discontinuity. So if you, you take the derivative, this functional derivative on the left hand side or the right hand side, oh, John is standing up. You're not giving me. Okay, are you giving me some credit because I answer lots of questions? <laughs> <laughs> you can go on for a while without leading into your question. All right. Okay. So, so, so this, if you take this e equation, this is first of all. You take the difference of this equation, then what do you get? You would, this two term will not contribute, will contribute to these two terms. So the gap, will come from the uh, on the positive side minus Ts from the negative side and uh, Vxc from the positive side minus Vxc from the minus side. And this is related to the constant as value, which I will not have time to describe it. This is the derivative discontinuity in the VXC, in the potential. Okay? And that's the derivative continuity in the exchange correlation potential. Even in a, in a, in, so this is the, the expression for gap. There is another way to look at the gap. It's not by solving this equation. We really don't solve this equation in, co in, in concept calculation. We do not solve this equation at all. We solve the eigenvalue, constant eigenvalue equation. So, so the second way to calculate the chemical potential is to take the derivative with respect to fractional number, and that wasn't uh, done until uh, 2008 PRB paper from my book. That we saw how to calculate chemical potential for any functional and whether you do OEP or do generalized concept. So the expression for chemical potential was derived for all the scenario. With the, any approximate functional, whether you do it in generalized concept or in concept. So I will not divide it here, but I'm running out of time, but I'll tell you the result. Okay. So we take functional, which be, uh, first it will be explicit Exc is functional of rho. This is uh, explicit, explicit functional rho, like LDA, GGA, because given density, you can divide explicit. Or you can look at Exc as an implicit functional rho, but the explicit functional of density matrix. So it will be rho of R R prime. So that's the Hutchie fork functional or hybrid functional related. So this is the Hutchie fork type functional or hybrid functional. This is LDA GTA. So example would be LDA 
CCA. This example will be Hachi fog hybrid. And we do calculation with concept or generalized concept. Okay. So the chemical potential is the um, depend on where you adding electron or taking electron away. So the the derivation was going through a potential functional concept, which I don't have time to explain. But the the rigorous result was derived in this paper is that the chemical potential is equal to the constant frontier as a value. If F means the frontier orbital, whether it is adding electron, then you take the normal. If you're taking electron away, you you the normal. Okay, so the F means homo or normal, depending on plus or minus. And in the hybrid functional, if you do consent, which will mean that you are doing a OEP calculations, then it's more complicated. So it's mu plus homo plus a a difference. So it's not exactly equal to the homo energy or the normal energy. But if you do a GKS with this, of course, this two is the same anyway. GKS can be identical without with KS for a LDA GTA type functional. And for the hg 4 in this, then it is equal to this. So if you are you have a functional like a hybrid functional or a hg 4 type functional, then the without the chemical potential is exactly equal to the eigenvalue. Where they add electron or take electron away, the two numbers. So that means that the gap, if you calculate the gap from this difference, then you can see how to calculate the gap from this type of functions. So this is uh, this is not addressing whether it is good approximation or bad approximation. It is whatever approximation the functional provide. What is the right way to calculate the chemical potential from that particular approximation? If you have extreme functional or functional benching matrix, that's the right formula to calculate. How good it is or how bad it is depends on how good your functional. If your functional has really reduced delocalization error, then you should expect the prediction of gap to be good. And if your functional has delocalization error, then you will underestimate the gap. I didn't explain why it's underestimated, but it's also related to the curvature. Okay. I think I'm stopping here. Thank you. So we have about uh, seven minutes for questions. I answer all the questions. Yes. Um, so when you write, when you define new as yes. L V del capital N. Yes. So that means at each point you essentially find the minimum of energy and then you express E as a function function of N. Yes, that's the mu. However, in in the other definition of mu, here E is actually a, a function of the density. Correct. And then you differentiate with respect to density. Uh, how so are these two the same? Yes, okay, very good question. So this one is actually an awkward expression of chemical potential, but it's correct one. So th this is the order Lagrangian equation for the stationary condition if you know the functional diversion. But and so this is R dependent. This on the left hand side is constant. And that's so this is a partial differential integral equation that one has to solve, like you solve the Thomas Fermi theory to get the answer. Of course, while in practice we don't solve this equation, but in principle you can solve this equation. So these two are exact identical. And this relationship from here deriving to here, actually it is uh, it is rigorously derived. You can you can look at the part in your book. It's that. Yes? Uh, I have a question regarding the first part of the lecture. You yes. said the band gap was too small. Yes. Uh, how can it be corrected? Uh, or was oh. it corrected? How so let me explain why it's too small. If your curve is not straight, let's say like here. 
So this is a n, n minus 1, n plus 1. Then get the, two, the curve here, the prediction of a chemical potential, what will happen? You take the slope here, what, what will be the prediction for i compared to this number? Too small. So too small, too small i. How about a? You predict your slope will come to here. Too large. So i minus a is too small. That's the that's the the, the reason. How do you correct? Then you should design the functional has minimum delocalization error. Then you have a hope. Okay. Yes. So um, how are you changing your practical charge and practical spin at the same time? So if I go along one path, where I simply remove one fraction of the, the fraction of charge in one of the, the orbitals of one spin, I should get a different curvature than if I remove a uh, fraction of charge from both uh, both spin channels at the same time. Is that correct? Uh, can you repeat the question one more time? Sure. Okay. So I have two channels of orbitals. Yes. And I'm fractionally removing charge. Yes. If I fractionally remove charge from just one channel mm -hmm. versus fractionally remove charge from both channels at the same time, yeah. you're saying that those the, the two uh, slopes should be different. It should be the same. You well, as long as you change the, the same the number. Should be the same, but yes. The GTA will give you That's time. exactly yes. Okay. Yes. You got it. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, it's too high. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's too late to the gap. If you, are, you have too small gap, then think about the most important contribution is homo to lumo uh, change for progressibility, right? So what, what happened to progressibility is you can also think about fractional charge. You have a long molecule, put in an electric field, a weak electric field, what will happen? You move part of the electron from this end to the other end. So you get fractional charge, a fractional hole at both ends. So you have a fractional object that is too low energy. Too low energy means too high polarizability, right? Conductance is similar. It's related to the gap. It's all related to the gap. But, uh, but it's, they are all part of the systematic error. Okay. Um, so this, this may be a silly question, but mm. so, so if I've got a finite system with quantum, yes. and I want to find some sort of gap, yes. why not I, I mean, you said the way you have an integer number, mm. it's very small, so why don't I just do the integer with one less, yeah. do it again with one more? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a wonderful uh, question. And uh, I'll tell you, this work for very small systems, and uh, um, I'll, I can show you a figure, but I, I'm not allowed to show slides, so, I, so I, I, I can show you later. This type of finite difference calculation is good for an atom and small number of atoms to get you really good answer because the, you are using the finite difference between the integers. But as your system increase, and, and then you'll see the result get worse and worse. The system increase doesn't have to be uh, interacting. You can you can be thinking about it. Uh, I I can show you a figure of helium atom and I did one 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 helium atom. You get take the difference between the finite and beautiful um, a number from LDA GGA hybrid. You get all beautiful. You just add one more helium at four away from it in the same calculation. Four way actually is no interacting, doesn't matter at all. But then your, your error increase. Adding one more, you increase again. Adding one more, you increase. So so this procedure of uh, finite difference only work for small systems, very, very small, and it is not a solution. So this solution lies in the intrinsic problem of the delocalization error. Maybe one more short question. I'll follow up on this last point, just first that I agree completely. I just want maybe to give another example. If you take a silicon cluster and you start increasing the silicon cluster more and more and more, you calculate the ionization potential and total energy differences, the sum for the electron affinity, 
in the hope of inferring the bulk of yeah, then you will discover that in the limit of a sufficiently large system, you get the gap that you calculate this way actually converges to the Conchan gap instead of to the true gap, which is part basically for the same reason. Exactly. The helium is a simpler case. And I, I, I even use a helium atom as a spectator, not chemically relevant at all. You, so you see the problem. So finite difference is not a solution. It, it, the intrinsic functional cannot, error in that cannot be overcome by a finite difference. It is a very active area of research that there's lots of people working on. Okay, let's uh, thank Whitehall again.